Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen then, Ted. Is that what you'd like? Okay, great. I. Right. How's that? We're good. Yeah, that looks okay. beautiful. We can see okay. Mi'kmaqi. Wonderful, and I'm I'm joining you here today from Mi'kmaqi, uh, the the eastern part of of this country of Canada. I'm in a place right around here, in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, and it's a. Uh, it's a, just a tremendous pleasure to be here. This territory is known as the, the people of the dawn, and this is Alan Sillaboy's uh, depiction of uh, being the people of the dawn here in this territory. This is also the territory of the peace and friendship treaties. These are pre-confederation treaties that uh, were designed to maintain Mi'kmaq governance, Mi'kmaq sovereignty, over their territory and over their resources, uh, celebrating and honoring their ancestral connections to the territory and all of the spirits that reside in the territory since time immemorial. Part of what I, I'd like to do with you tonight is, is share, uh, share what's, what's in truth and conviction, but also some of the work that we're doing right now here in Mi'kmaq. And I've been receiving really important teachings and I'm ever grateful to all of the Mi'kmaq people who have, I've met on this, this incredible journey. And most recently uh, with Grand Chief uh, Norman Sillaboy, who has been teaching me about how we really need to know where we're coming from. And Don Wedebeksik is the Mi'kmaq word for knowing who you are and where you come from. And when it gil is, who are your people? And that's an important positioning, both for uh, settlers, but also for, for Mi'kmaq people in this territory who are, are uh, grounding themselves and unifying themselves in their connection to each other. So it's an important part of, of the journey. Another really important teaching that I've been shared is, is Get Me Day Demenage, which is the Mi'kmaq term for honor. And part of the journey that I'm on with you today is to honor uh, the legacy of Donald Marshall Jr. and to, to share some of uh, his story and our story together. So it's a great pleasure to be there. And Get Me Day Demenege is also considered the foundational law of the Mi'kmaq. Honor is, is at the basis of, of justice. And tonight, uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to, well, it's nighttime here, it's, a, it's still afternoon over there, uh, but to sit, share a story with you, Adawakan, so sharing story. So let's go to 1971. In 1971, the Grand Chief of the Mi'kmaq Nation was a man named Donald Marshall Sr. And the role of the Grand Chief is one that predated Confederation, that went back uh, long before colonists settled into the territory. And it was an important role leading the people of Mi'kmaq and, and, and helping them manage their disputes and making decisions about where to, to hunt and to fish and to live and to gather and to celebrate all of the, the life markers in the cycle of life. And Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. had a son and his eldest son was Donald Marshall Jr., who many of you may be familiar with. The role of Grand Chief in a contemporary time was a symbolically important role, but he was still an important political leader uh, and religious and spiritual leader to guide the Mi'kmaq nation. And Grand Chief uh, Marshall was certainly an important figure in this story. This is a petroglyph depiction of the nation of Mi'kmaq and the leadership of the Grand Council. Now he's an important guy. I mean, he gets to meet the Pope. He's, uh, he, he's called upon as a ceremonial figurehead. He was an upstanding citizen of Sydney, Nova Scotia. He had a very important drywall business, but he was also very, very much grounded in his customary practices and his teachings and his language, fluent Mi'kmaq speaker, and uh, was really dedicated to, to his nation and leading his nation. In Sydney, Nova Scotia in 1971, the town and the reserve of member to First Nation, which is where Grand Chief, Member, uh, Grand Chief Marshall resided, was 
one that was very divided. One, you didn't see a lot of intersection between the community and the reserve. And the reserve had gone through a forced relocation back in the uh, early 1900s. And they'd been parceled off into this place. And part of the role of police was to keep the, the Mi'kmaq people separate from the community in the town and particularly the boys and the girls from, from mixing during this time in the 1970s. This story in 1971 starts in uh, May 28th, which was the Grand Chief's birthday. And it was in a place called Wentworth Park. And Donald Marshall Jr., Grand Chief's eldest son, who would have normally taken over as Grand Chief in a hereditary role had he had the opportunity to take on uh, the apprenticeship that would be required to take on such an important role, was walking through Wentworth Park after being at a, trying to get into a dance. They had dances in church halls in those days. And he ran into uh, a young man, Sandy Seal, who was a black young man from uh, this, the pier in Sydney. And the two of them ran into two other people and uh, uh, an attack ensued and both men were injured. Sandy Seal was stabbed in the, in the abdomen and Donald Marshall was stabbed in the arm. Unfortunately, uh, Sandy Seal passed away from his injuries and Donald Marshall was, you know, sought help, went, called, called for assistance. And the story turns very, very dark, very quickly. Uh, as I mentioned, the role of the police was really about keeping uh, Mi'kmaq people separate from the town people. And uh, as a result of this stabbing in a park where you saw from the earlier image that lots of people used to gather and, and have a good time, this had become a, a big problem for the police and the police were really being uh, challenged on their ability to maintain social control. And there was all kinds of uh, challenges to that social control. And so the public pressure was certainly on the police to resolve this crime, uh, this tragic stabbing death of Sandy Seal. And so they focused in on what happened uh, at that evening and who was there. And Donald Marshall was certainly there with Sandy Seal as they encountered two other people when uh, a, a terrible dispute broke out. And it, the laser focus of the police of Sydney, Nova Scotia, which was a municipal police force on Donald Marshall Jr. was transformative to his life. And in fact, without very thorough investigation of the crime scene, without doing a house to house, without uh, accurately bringing forward lineups of people that matched the uh, description that Donald Marshall had given police. And, and you know, despite Donald Marshall hanging around in the, in the police station all day, waiting for them to bring in the, in the perpetrators, uh, Marshall himself became the, the target through that tunnel vision and, and was charged with the murder of Sandy Seal. And uh, he was picked up uh, and brought into uh, custody where he remained. In the course of the investigation, the police coerced witnesses or not even witnesses because the people that were in the park at the night uh, did not see the altercation, did not see Roy Ebsery stab Sandy Seal, but they were, were convinced and through intimidation and through police tactics, uh, repression to uh, give testimony that was ultimately perjured testimony. They were deliberately telling lies during the trial and uh, because of the way that the police had led the investigation. And as a consequence of that, there, there was even, you know, <laughs> one of the, the, the people giving testimony during this extraordinary trial recanted his testimony right there and, and, and told the Grand Chief, no, I, I did not see your son 
kill Sandy Seal. The, the court said nothing of it. Not, they didn't. They didn't deal with it properly, as we later learn in the in the uh, royal commission that was to come. But what was even more astonishing in in all of this, there was error after error after error and misjustice after misjustice in this case. The jury was a jury of all white males, no peers of Donald Marshall. Donald Marshall was a fluent Mi'kmaq speaker. He had no familiarity with the justice system and he had some naive faith that the justice system would recognize his innocence and uh, he would be set free after this trial uh, was concluded, but that was not the case. And in four hours, the jury deliberated and came back with the finding of guilty, as you can see here. And that was 50 plus years ago on November 5th of 1971. And basically after that finding, case closed. And even though people came forward, in fact, uh, Jimmy McNeil, the person that was with Roy Epsuri, the person who was convicted of murdering Sandy Steele, uh, to disclose to police that he knew that Donald Marshall had not killed Sandy Steele and that he knew that uh, Roy Epsuri had killed Sandy Steele. Uh, the, the police did not disclose this information to Junior's lawyers. And as a consequence, there was no uh, thorough investigation. The investigation that they did conduct was very limited and, uh, and led to Donald Marshall spending uh, a life term in prison. He was 17 years old when this all started. So he was a young boy. Um, he grew up in prison. In 1979, he made a, a quick escape uh, and the headlines were all you know, armed murderer uh, escapes. And I, you know, the stories that he shared with me about the escape were um, uh, completely different than the, 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 the representation by, by the media, of course. And uh, he was, uh, he, it took, you know, his own, own efforts. Ultimately, he maintained his innocence. He couldn't get pro, pro parole because uh, you wouldn't show remorse. I mean, how can you show remorse for a crime you haven't committed? And it was a, an ordeal. He survived prison riots. He, it was a, a, an extraordinarily taxing time on his life. And when he finally got out through his own efforts and through nobody else's really, it was his own determination, his own incredible tenacity. And, and, and I think also the faith his, his family gave to him and, and encouraged him uh, to, to persist. There, there was a, another horrible experience when the court of appeal said, well, uh, it must be your fault, Donald Marshall, that you were wrongly convicted. And uh, we're going to blame you uh, for your wrongful conviction. And we're going to try and wash our hands of it. And it, there were just so many bad dealings, so many uh, revelations of non-disclosure of information that were happening. And uh, there was incredible resistance to the idea of an investigation. No one in this country had been wrongfully convicted, or at least not publicly came to public awareness. And so the, you know, the governments of Nova Scotia, of Canada, wow, we're not interested in dealing with this, this story that really shook the foundations of the Canadian justice system. But a, a tenacious group of, of lawyers and Donald Marshall himself committed to revealing the truth and a royal commission into the Donald Marshall Jr. prosecution was launched and, you know, a hundred and odd days of testimony were held and a very expensive for that time in 19, um, it started in 86, I think it was, and went till the re release of the report in 1989. Uh, after we had to have a conviction of, of uh, Roy Epsiri during that time. And it took three trials and Roy Epsiri certainly didn't get life sentence, uh, which is also an evidence of systemic discrimination in that whole process as well. But that's a story for another day. 
Donald Marshall was forced to testify, of course, at the Royal Commission, and it was an extremely difficult time in his life. The Royal Commission itself, transformative seven volumes of material came out. It's actually every piece of the, the Royal Commission is now available in Nova Scotia archives. So I encourage you to, to investigate this incredibly rich resource. And the commission found that there was systemic discrimination at every turn in the justice system. And it was, while well, the, the impetus for the wrongful conviction certainly was the tunnel vision of John McIntyre, and the Sydney police force, the judges, the politicians, everybody that was involved in this case, uh, and the way they responded to it and the way they responded to Donald Marshall and his identity as a Mi'kmaq person really pointed to horrific racism at every turn. And certainly uh, his arrest, his wrongful conviction, the acquittal, the court of appeal decision, all of it was a horror story due to the fact that Donald Marshall Jr. was native at the time. But he survived this. Miraculously, he survived this somewhat intact. And he got to celebrate with his family and share the love of people who were unwavering in their support of his innocence. And, and uh, but he was the first to become part of another family, the family of those who are wrongly convicted in Canada. And he joined the family that, that Innocence Canada is, is shaping and, and supporting. And there are many more coming and many more indigenous peoples who are wrongly convicted, who need support from, from Canadians and from, uh, from this organization. And I really admire the work they do, but he was at the cutting edge, if you will, of this, of this extended family that's happening. I come into this story after the, this revelation of Canada's justice system as being an unjust system for Indigenous peoples. I too had this naive faith in the Canadian justice system that, you know, it's fair, it's honest, it treats people equally. And, uh, watching and listening to the, the outcomes of the Marshall Inquiry, and then compounding that with the Kanasatake resistance, the Oka crisis in the 1990s, really uh, awoke in me a, a, a sense of, wow, it, it, there really is racism in this country. And I, I really had no idea, coming from white settler privilege uh, in, in uh, in my bubble, I, uh, I uh, was really shaken to the core and by particularly the fact that the Canadian government called into the, the army uh, on these peaceful protesters that wanted to protect their sacred territory and their burial grounds from a golf course expansion. You know, so I was getting incredibly outraged and I was in my you know, early 20s, mid, early to mid 20s. And so it was at a time that I certainly needed to wake up. And as I was moving to Nova Scotia, having never been there, I paused in a hotel room with my mother in Riviere de Lou, and the only thing on television was this film called Justice Denied. And it told the story of the wrongful conviction of Donald Marshall. And my mom and I watched this show and, and it you know, retold this, the story of his, of his uh, the, the night of the murder and the wrongful conviction and uh, the horrible incarceration. And it was showing because it was in honor of, the CBC was showing this, to honor the legacy of Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. who had just passed away. And there was footage of the, the ceremony of his funeral. And it was quite, it was incredibly moving. Little did I know, Three weeks later or so, I'd be at the Misty Moon Cabaret, downtown Halifax, fine drinking establishment, at a Jeff Healy concert. He was touring his, I forget what it was, but I remember Angel Eyes was the, the big song of the night. And there I met Donald Marshall Jr. 
And uh, my life changed significantly from that point forward. And uh, we were together for about 13 years. And in that time, we had an incredible journey. The Royal Commission had just really been released in the early 1990s, in the early 1990, and I was there in 1991. And the Royal Commission came up with 82 recommendations to answer to the problems of systemic racism in the Canadian justice system. Many of those were uh, related to policing, uh, I think 40, 37 or something more, just almost half of the recommendations were about transformation and policing. Other key recommendations dealt with uh, disclosure, the, the change of uh, disclosure legislation, which the Supreme Court picked up in the Stinchcomb case. Uh, they also dealt with administration of justice. And so they changed, they developed a public prosecution office to separate it from the attorney generals because there was all kinds of interference in Marshall's case and in particularly his appeal and acquittal. In Mi'kmaq, the Mi'kmaq really were embracing the, the Marshall inquiry recommendations as a platform for politics of transformation, but also politics of embarrassment, and as the, the legitimizing factor for saying, hey, we want our own justice system. We want to be sovereign in our territory. We want to take control because the Canadian justice system certainly cannot take good care of our people as they come before it. And so their strategy was to, to have a, sort of a two, two path, two Two, uh, you know, like a two row wampum sort of analogy there of saying we want to improve the Canadian justice system by indigenizing it, but indigenizing the justice system alone isn't going to decolonize it. We need to do a lot more work on uh, a standalone justice system. And so these are the recommendations that focus primarily on Mi'kmaq the criminal justice system at that time. And uh, Donald was involved in every transformation that occurred from this, you know, the advocacy of the uh, implementation of the recommendations up until his death in, in 2009. And I am sorry to report that very few of these recommendations have been sustained. Some of them have been momentarily checked off but very few have been acted on with substance. And uh, I, you know, it would take me uh, days of lecture to, to go on into, into that. But I can tell you there has been movement, but there's been also a lot of uh, step backward, which is really frustrating, particularly given the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action on justice. But I'll hop to that in a minute. One of the key things that came out of the Marshall Inquiry was the creation of the Mi'kmaq Tripartite Forum, which brings together Mi'kmaq, the Nova Scotia, and the federal government to act on concerns of the Mi'kmaq Nation. And it has had interesting successes in, in things like culture and heritage, uh, but less substantive success in driving the ag uh, justice agenda changes. One of the big transformations that came out that was short-lived was the Unamagi Tribal Police. And this is something that we are certainly looking at on the national level with the legislative uh, framework that's upcoming. Now that First Nations policing is finally, many decades later, uh, been recognized as essential service. So there's lots of transformation going on there. There's also the creation of a Mi'kmaq Justice Institute, which collapsed like the Unamagi Tribal Police, but then emerged as the Mi'kmaq Legal Support Network. This is a court worker program. It has a customary law component. It has potential to answer the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation, particularly number 42, number 50, uh, and all of those other recommendations that pertain to calls to action that pertain to justice as well as the missing and murdered Indigenous women calls to justice. However, it won't be able to do that. It can't act on it because it's being strangled by inadequate funding. It's being strangled by uh, 
just, you know, death by a thousand cuts. And it's extremely frustrating. It used to be the cutting edge in the country, the cutting edge uh, indigenous service program. And it really, uh, really needs some support for it to be able to support all of the complexities of treaty implementation and livelihood rights and so on. So we've been doing a lot of work looking into Mi'kmaq legal consciousness and legal principles in our efforts to revitalize them and remobilize them in a way to, to ensure Mi'kmaq people get justice sovereignty. And we've looked at the, the various principles that are really continuing to be at play that are outside of the Canadian justice system, but are also becoming uh, co-opted by the Canadian justice system in some in some ways in 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 uh, in a, particularly in the sentencing circles that are occurring in the diversion programs that are there but really need to be more robustly supported but uh, there's a there's a lot of healing work and healing narrative in the in the legal principles of the Mi'kmaq and Abik is is really this relational justice that's uh, very much vibrant and at play in Mi'kmaq. And it's a it's a holistic approach to justice that's being remobilized, that's grounded in language, that's grounded in land, it's grounded in territory, and uh, is really foundational on respect and relations with each other. Another key principle in Mi'kmaq is Nogma, all my relations. And maybe uh, Dr. Palm, Pam Palmeter will speak to this in your in your next uh, in your next uh, speaker series. But one of the key teachings that, that's really grounding all of our work as we try to transform uh, justice practice here in and in, in decolonizing justice and doing that big uh, transformative work, not only in the Canadian justice system, but also in resource regulation and fisheries, that Mi'kmaq really have a, a, a deep held belief around the spiritual connection, the spiritual embeddedness of, of ancestors in the territory, in the air, in the sky, in the water, in all the beings that are, whether it's the, the grass, the earth, the animate, the inanimate, the water, all interacting. And so there's, there's a duty to, to honor uh, those uh, spirits and protect those spirits for future generations. Much of our work has been focused on the, the how, how colonization impacted Mi'kmaq legal principles in order to respond to what, what, how do you challenge the justice system or how do you challenge systemic discrimination or racism? You need to understand uh, the, 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 the manifestation of colonization and its impacts in order to undo it. And we've been doing that also through our, our treaty education work and looking at treaty implementation and building relations uh, with settlers and indigenous peoples through treaty education. Now, I've got to say, I've been watching the fisheries issues. You know that we're not all that successful, but we're working and we're not giving up. And, and, and more and more, we're seeing the, the ally base grow. Uh, the Mi'kmaq Treaty Day is held on October 1st, uh, and it was really revitalized. It's part of the 1752 treaty. It's, it's in those series of treaties, the covenant chain of treaties that were pre-Confederation peace and friendship treaties. And Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. after the Simon decision in 1985, which recognized the 1752, really uh, reinvigorated this very important day. And it has been on October 1st ever since. Now treaties are nation to nation agreements. They do protect the Mi'kmaq as sovereign. And it's these treaties that really were at the source of what would become the Marshall decision. So after all of this, you know, hectic life of being in the, the spotlight with the Royal Commission and the first wrongful conviction in Canada, Donald Marshall just wanted to go fishing. And from the moment I met him, all he talked about was eel fishing. If it wasn't jail stories, it was eel fishing, right? It was a very interesting life and he had a fantastic narrative, but he found peace fishing. He loved to fish. It could be, you know, that was, and because it was where he connected 
you really connected with, with the, the land and you wanted to fish eels. And I'm thinking, okay, why not? If this is gonna make you happy, I'll get in a boat full of slimy snakes, whatever, I love you. So it's gonna be fine. And we did, and we fished eels and it was a crazy adventure, a lot of fun, a lot of challenges. This was our, our eel fishing crew. This was our very, very first payday. We were doing this to earn a living and earn a livelihood. Uh, you know, we needed to put money on the table. And uh, this was the eel buyer and half of these guys weren't even fishing eels. They just wanted to be in the, the photo. This is in Mulligawatch, a, a place that will always be near and dear to my heart. This is Donald here in the yellow pants and there I am, <laughs> my rugged fishing days. And it was a great community and it really connected him to his treaty practice, to his traditional practice. These are our fishing nets uh, drying on our lawn, uh, getting ready for the fishing season. And Junior would always give the best, the prime eels to the elders as was custom. And, and that really helped him to connect to those teachings that were so vitally important, the sharing and the neduklamek, the idea of, of uh, responsible harvesting and resource sharing, critically important to Mi'kmaq well-being. And uh, here is an old photo of a, an elder drawing the eels. This was Junior's favorite dish with the eels. He proudly made this. These are his hands holding this loose skin again in baked eel and uh, which he enjoyed very much. But that uh, bliss did not last long. The law of course came knocking again and uh, we were out fishing in Pumpkit in a, in a place near Bucknakik First Nation community here on the mainland just down the road from me and uh, three of us were out fishing and the DFO officers approached us and said, hey, what are you doing? And Junior said, I'm fishing. And he goes, where's your license? And Junior says, I don't need a license. I've got the Treaty of 1752. And so it began this journey of uh, begin getting charged with fishing without a license, fishing with illegal gear in a closed season and selling fish without a, a license. That was a journey. Junior did not really want to take at all, uh, but he recognized that this was a fight for his nation and he was willing to do that. And he really drew on the teachings of his father, the Grand Chief, and he really, I, I think, found the energy despite beginning to really feel the impacts of uh, uh, COPD and he had a really degenerative lung disease that was, was beginning to kill him. And he found the energy, however, to, to undertake this. So we got charged in 1993. Uh, the case didn't get to court in Annie Ganesh until 1996. It didn't get before the Supreme Court came down in its decision in 1999. So it was a really long journey. Of course, it had to go to appeal. It was hard. It was hard on him. And being back in front of this justice system that had so betrayed him was an arduous journey. And when the decision came down in 1999, it, I'm still vibrating <laughs> from that moment. And, and I think everybody who was there uh, in, in, in the spirit of what was happening uh, can recall where they were, what they were doing, when the Supreme Court affirmed uh, the, the Mi'kmaq right to earn a livelihood and to uh, really upheld the treaties of 1760 and 1761, part of the covenant chain of treaties of the Mi'kmaq. So Treaty Day from that moment on really took on new meaning uh, in lots of ways, but the, the decision was not met with peace and friendship uh, universally. The, the, uh, the Supreme Court concluded that the Mi'kmaq have the right to harvest fish and other resources to provide this moderate livelihood and that they can get sustenance and trade for necessities as per the treaty and as per the truck house clause in the treaties and that they are subject to regulation, but the Crown 
has to be justified in conservation or on other grounds of public interest. And they have to do that in consultation with. They can't just continue to regulate without uh, consulting the Mi'kmaq. And they didn't do a very good job of engaging with the Mi'kmaq around that right to livelihood. The commercial fishery uh, experienced a different kind of inclusion and in creating space, but the treaty-based fishery did not have the same kind of attention at that time. And it caused a lot of resistance and concern from the public. A, a lot of settlers got very, very, very concerned and, about Mi'kmaq rights. And, you know, there was, and then sure, this happens in British Columbia all the time when the indigenous rights around resource management, resource regulation favor indigenous peoples as it should, as first priority. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's in the Sparrow decision, it's in the Marshall decision, it's in the constitution for heaven's sakes. You know, all these places, uh, it, people got very upset. Uh, very, very upset. There is really very little understanding of the cultural values uh, that Mi'kmaq hold near and dear in terms of uh, their time immemorial knowledge, in terms of Nisit Nogama, in terms of Nduklamek, the harvesting practices. And uh, they just said, you know, Mi'kmaq are going to destroy, they're going to fish it out. You know, if you count the number of people that actually still fish in Mi'kmaq, it's still quite modest compared to the enormity of the commercial fishery and lobster, particularly out here in the East Coast, but they are making their space slowly, but certainly. However, the, the, the situation on the water was uh, dangerous. It was violent. It was completely traumatic for, for Junior himself to witness this. He, he spoke out, he rised, he encouraged unity, uh, and it was very difficult. Out of this, the Mi'kmaq, uh, worked very, very hard to create a space where the Crown would come and negotiate with them on the right. And the, 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 the Department of Fisheries and Oceans was notorious for not really coming to the table for a long period of time on those issues of livelihood. The, the commercial fishery developed and Mi'kmaq were, you know, worked very hard. They named their first fleet after Donald Marshall Jr. And there's a Donald Marshall Sr., which was a tremendous honor. But, you know, for decades, uh, very, very little movement on the treaty implementation, on the, the sovereign work of, of Mi'kmaq. And if you look at the, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the Truth and Reconciliation, Commission cause action tell us to do. There's a lot of space there for self determination and self governance in fisheries. On the 20th anniversary, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans give back Donald's eel nets, which was a very strange uh, step of reconciliation and one that were you know I think I'm still perplexed with. It was very interesting to you know see my handwriting on those plastic jugs and to see the nets again. And you know if only Donald had been alive, he he wanted those nets back for the you know ever since they took them. Of course, um, so it was an interesting gesture. Uh, but the 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 work of, of of reconciliation is is been very symbolic and not substantive in terms of decolonizing the regulatory framework of DFO and its enforcement agencies. And we certainly saw that, uh, you know, with how the Marshall decision was being engaged with decades down and the Mi'kmaq chiefs will certainly, there's a very clear record and it's in truth and conviction about how frustrated they were with the inactivity. Now, September 17th, 2020, was a key date and certainly all eyes turned to Mi'kmaq as Benekadik went fishing for their livelihood fishery and met with, uh, again, that explosive resistance that we saw in uh, 2000 after the Supreme Court decision and the violence that occurred, the destruction of food here is uh, uh, appalling to, to everyone, I think. and. Uh, the gear, the millions of dollars of gear, the Mi'kmaq gear that's being destroyed, little interference 
uh, with the, the perpetrators of these crimes has been frustrating and certainly a mob mentality. And so we, we questioned, you know, how far are we getting on this reconciliation journey in Mi'kmaq? And there, the divisiveness that has occurred uh, needs a lot of work to, to get back to the, the peace and friendship that really are at the heart of Mi'kmaq treaties. Certainly the Mi'kmaq have mobilized and are, are challenging the, the racial discrimination and, and they've put Canada on notice. And as I mentioned earlier, we really are mobilizing these uh, calls to action in, in uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because we do see that the Mi'kmaq have a, a system, a process of justice that really needs to be upheld. And you're, you're doing it beautifully in, in Victoria with the, the fantastic uh, work at UVic and, and elsewhere. Nova, you know, New Brunswick has an Indigenous justice strategy that's just been released. And I'm, I'm hoping Nova Scotia will, will catch up. We're certainly uh, mobilizing. And, and some of the work we're doing here on Ulnawe Dubladachinis Mi'kmaq Law uh, is focusing on these very fundamental practices of institutionalizing Indigenous justice and really working at legal education and the indigenization, the, the two way. And there are significant transformations coming in, in kinship and in customary law and certainly policing relations, but also in the diplomatic and livelihood governance. And, and we, won't, uh, we won't stop in, until we're there. And the duplomic is a really fascinating principle, and I won't go into much detail because I see our time is coming to a close, but I, I do want to uh, just sort of highlight why it's so important here in Mi'kmaq that the new duplomic livelihood plans be embraced by everyone and supported because there is, you know, the constitutionally protected right to livelihood. There's also the treaty protected right, but there's also a, a great sensibility about resource um, responsibility and harvesting in uh, an, an inequitable and sustainable ways that's foundational to the well being and can be transformative for you know, bringing forward equality and bringing forward an end to poverty and bringing forward food on people's tables. And these things will help reduce the violence that people are feeling and experiencing, not only with the systemic uh, discrimination that's imposed upon them, but also internally and, and being able to live well with each other and then fulfill those obligations that are deep in the, the being of people generation over generation over generation to ensure a secure future. So we're working at this re constituting of Nduklamek as, as a foundation for governance here in Mi'kmaq. And it's, it's a profoundly uh, exciting and fascinating effort. I do wanna close off with the, some of the major changes in, in the indigenization of the Canadian justice system. There's the opening of the Donald Marshall Jr. Center for Justice, for Reconciliation and Justice. This is a court in Wagmakuk. It's the first uh, court that's designed by community, with community, uh, and, in Can and the Nova Scotia justice system in, in, in Mi'kma'ki. There is a provincial court that's just closed in Eskazoni, and that's another tangent, and I can get easily outraged about it. It's an, an abomination that the first court uh, that was on, on reserve is closing because of uh, structural safety for, for the courts. I mean, they should be able to correct that. There are gonna be more people going, getting charged and, and being wrongfully convicted or pleading guilty, but let me get back to the Marshall <laughs> Court. Ted, I'm excited and, and enraged at the same time. Here we have Marlis Edward, who was Donald's counsel at, uh, at the Royal Commission. And you can see behind, uh, uh, just a collection of the Nova Scotia judiciary and also very honored to have Justice Harry LaForme there, one of the first Indigenous Court of Appeal judges in the country uh, celebrating this moment. And we were repatriating a feather that was juniors that had been gifted to him by the family of Wilson Nipus who had also been wrongly convicted 
of murder and a horrible crime and you know, spent time in jail. And that family had gifted us with this feather and I gifted it to Marlis for all her work that she had done for Junior. She wanted to gift it back to the court. And so we were doing this in ceremony with Judge Laurel Halfpenny McCorry orchestrating, a, a choreographing a beautiful uh, event. And here she is with Chief Norman uh, and, and Chief Rod and uh, Elder Molly Puro. And this is the dais, the circular dais. And you can see the seven sacred teachings in the background. And here's the, the court honoring with all of Junior's counsel and Derek, Judge Ann Derek now who's on the Court of Appeal. And the, the community gifted the presiding judges with these beautiful sashes of beadwork of the seven sacred teachings. And so it's a phenomenal court that's done in ceremony. It's a healing to wellness court. It, it's, you know, you walk in and you get cleans, cleansed with the sage and the sweet grass and the cedar and there are elders providing teachings and, and people have hope in this justice uh, system in this, in this court in particular. And so they've done a really remarkable job, but it too needs the support. It too is, is under-resourced uh, phenomenally and needs navigators and it, it's got great potential. Steve Aronson, Ann Derrick, Marlis Edwards and Fila Kakioni. So I'm hoping that I have in sharing this narrative with you of, of I'm honoring Junior's legacy and, and so much more that he has given to the Mi'kmaq Nation and to myself and to my family and to um, all of the people of Mi'kmaq uh, in a good way. And I really appreciate uh, this, this time with you. I, uh, they're, they're, I go on and on and oh. I, I want to, to you know, hope that they would share with you the Mi'kmaq word for peace. I don't know how to pronounce it well, uh, but this is a, a, an image made by Amanda Brooks. And I think it really is a, a good way for us to, to, think mm -hmm. about, to think about peace and friendship and to think about those treaties in a, in a good way. So I'll leave it there, Ted. <laughs> and, uh, thank you so much, Jane. I, uh, was, I know you had a lot to put in there in that short time that we had together, but I think you did a beautiful job. You started with honor, and, and that comes through all the way through the book of how the Mi Mi'kmaq peoples who were there, uh, that, you, uh, that you shared their stories as well, that they behaved in honor in the, in the face of so much uh, resistance and res racism. Uh, all the way through because they stayed true to those uh, uh, those words. I, I wrote it down, Masid no um, Just that uh, staying true to what their ancestors told them that they needed to do, uh, all with the land and all of their relations through it all. And there was no other way that they could go about being who they were without compromising all of those teachings uh, and continue to do that across the country. Um, you talked about rights and titles and treaties, and, and I know we have the treaties on Vancouver Island uh, that we, are, we, we don't teach about at all. And the people who live on those territories know little to nothing about their responsibilities as settlers on those territories. Uh, so you've helped us a lot on our pathway here, given us things to think about. Um, I love the part that you shared about healing and relationality, and it's important its importance in all of the sectors. And we're attempting to do that in our education sector too, just by bringing in information. Um, and I thought you did a lo lovely honor to the uh, Mi'kmaq language. Uh, I love that all of those teachings that are based in what seem to be such simple words that have thousands of years of depth behind them and, uh, and teachings in them. So thanks for joining us today. Um, and we'll keep your teachings in mind as we continue our pathways in education here in British Columbia. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for joining us today. We'll see you next time. <laughs>